Hi, my name is Robert Stern and I'm Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield. I've worked on Kant's philosophy for many years and published various books and papers on his ethics. In this talk, I will discuss most of section two of Kant's groundwork, in which he identifies the supreme principle of morality for a second time. But this time he gives it a name, the categorical imperative, and gives it in different formulations. We will consider those other formulations and how they might still fit together into just one principle. Kant begins by saying that whereas in section one he worked from common moral judgment and its conception of the good will, in this section he will get to the supreme principle a different way, this time by considering the faculty of practical reason, which is the faculty that tells us how to act and by considering the rules that govern it. He argues that there are two sorts of rules which govern practical reason, which he calls hypothetical and categorical imperatives. These are rules for us because they tell us to act in some way. That is, what makes them imperatives? You must do some action. But some imperatives tell you that you must do something as a means to some other end that you have. For example, if you want to be a pianist, you must practice one hour a day. These are hypothetical imperatives because they tell you what to do on the assumption or hypothesis that you want the end towards which some action is the means. By contrast, categorical imperatives tell you that you must do something regardless of any end you might desire. For example, you must not lie. Here is how Kant himself puts the distinction. Now, all imperatives command either hypothetically or categorically. The former represent a possible action as practically necessary as a means to achieving something else that one wants or may want. By contrast, the categorical imperative would represent the action as objectively necessary in itself, without reference to another end. Kant also says that only categorical imperatives count as genuine laws, because laws tell you to do something regardless of your desires, and hence command you to act. For example, you must pay your taxes is a law and a command which holds whether or not you want to pay your taxes. Likewise, you must not lie has nothing to do with whether or not you will achieve something you desire by not lying. It holds regardless of your desires, and so is a law. By contrast, a hypothetical imperative is not really a law, because you can escape it by dropping the relevant end. For example, if you drop your desire to be a pianist, then practicing an hour a day is no longer something you must do. But you can't escape a categorical must in this way because it doesn't depend on your desires. Kant now asks a fundamental question. How are all these imperatives possible? By this he means, perhaps there is something puzzling about these imperatives and how they can apply to us and this needs addressing. But he doesn't fully answer this question until section three, which we won't be discussing. Nonetheless, it is still worth seeing here why he thinks the question arises. In fact, he thinks there isn't really an issue with hypothetical imperatives, because in the case of these imperatives, it is easy to see why it is rational to follow them. For given you desire an end, it is rational to will the means, and it would be irrational not to do so. If you really want to be a pianist, you must will to practice an hour a day. But Kant thinks the real problem is with categorical imperatives, as these do not tell you to do something as a means to something you already desire, why is it rational to follow them? But on the other hand, we do think as rational agents, we should follow such imperatives and hence act morally. But what makes us rational to do so, given such imperatives, do not hold as a means to satisfying our desires. For surely, don't rational beings only ever act to satisfy their desires? As I have said, 
Kant raises the question here, but he doesn't try to answer it properly until section 3, and unfortunately we cannot cover that section in these talks. So here in section 2, Kant doesn't try to explain how it can make sense for rational agents to act on categorical imperatives. Instead, he takes this for granted and tries to show how from the idea of morality involving categorical and not hypothetical imperatives, he can again derive the supreme principle of morality. He argues for this as follows. We know that morality must consist in categorical imperatives and that such imperatives tell us to act in ways which hold not because of our desires, but as laws that apply to us regardless of our desires. It is therefore the case that the supreme principle of morality is itself a categorical imperative that instructs us to act on laws of this sort, and so tells us that we must act on maxims or principles of action that are fit to be such laws. But as Kant argued in section 1, laws hold universally and necessarily, so a maxim can only be moral if it can hold universally and necessarily. In this way, then, we arrive at a result that parallels the outcome of our inquiries in section 1. Therefore, there is just one categorical imperative, and it is this, act only on a maxim that you can also will to become a universal law. As before, you know that morality consists in universal laws, so to test whether your maxim is moral, this is the question you should ask, and hence is the principle you should use. However, Kant doesn't just stop with this formulation of the supreme principle, usually known as the formula of universal law, but goes on to offer several others, which we will now discuss. And we will also address the worry that this means that Kant doesn't end up with just one supreme principle of morality, but several principles. The first of these variants takes the original formulation and turns it into the following formulation, known as the formula of law of nature. Act as if the maxim of your action, by your will, were to become a universal law of nature. Kant explains this transition on the basis that nature is itself law-governed. So if you are asking if your maxim can become a universal law in accordance with the formula of universal law, you are also in effect asking if your maxim could be a law that governs nature in accordance with the formula of the law of nature. Before giving his other variants, Kant then applies these first two variants to four key examples. Firstly, the example of false promising discussed already in section 1, but also the examples of suicide, neglecting one's talents, and the failure to care for fellow human beings. In each of these cases, Kant tries to bring out how the maxim that contravenes the relevant duty suffers from a fundamental incoherence or contradiction if we were to take it to be a natural law. This can happen in two ways. Either we cannot even conceive it to be a law, for example, as we saw in section 1, lying promising would necessarily destroy itself, or we cannot will it to be a law. For example, no natural being with needs could will there to be a world in which no one helps anyone else, as this would be self-defeating. Kant thinks the first type of incoherence corresponds to strict duties which you can never violate, and the second to wider ones where you have more latitude. Thus far, therefore, although Kant has introduced a fairly minor variant on what we had in section 1, and has gone through some more examples, he hasn't departed much from the formulation we had previously. However, he now moves on to what may look like a very different formulation by asking a question he has not so far considered. Namely, what can serve as the end or goal of acting on a categorical imperative? What is it that following the categorical imperative will bring about, and why does this matter? 
The categorical imperative cannot be worth following because that way we satisfy our desires, because that would make it a hypothetical imperative instead. It must therefore be worth following because it relates to something that has value independently of our desires, which thus has absolute value as an end in itself rather than as a means to the satisfaction of our desires. But what is it that has such absolute value, which might form the ground or basis for such a categorical imperative? Kant's answer to this question is that the only plausible candidate for what has absolute value is rational beings such as people, rather than things we produce or non-rational beings such as animals. Kant argues that things we produce only have value because they satisfy our needs, so their value depends on us. And non-rational beings, such as animals, can clearly be used as means, or so Kant assumes. All that is left to serve the role, therefore, are rational products of nature, namely persons, who are therefore said to have the absolute value that is required without which there could be no supreme principle of morality at all. Moreover, once this is recognised, we can also see that another formulation of that principle is possible, namely the so-called formula of humanity. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or anyone else's, never merely as a means, but also always as an end. To show that this is a plausible variant, Kant then runs through the same examples as before, of suicide, false promising, neglecting one's talents, and neglecting other people, to establish that one can also show how these cases violate this principle as well. Furthermore, Kant suggests, now that we have introduced the idea of people as ends in themselves, in assessing our maxims, we can now ask not just whether they could be laws that coherently govern the world, but also whether these maxims could coherently be laws which people would adopt for themselves, as this seems necessary to treating them as ends in the first place. For I treat you as an end if I seek your consent for what I am asking you to do. Likewise, I treat you as an end if rather than forcing you to act in accordance with my maxim, I ask whether you could adopt it for yourself. This then leads to the next variant, which is often called the formula of autonomy. The supreme condition of the will's harmony with universal practical reason is the idea of the will of every rational being as a will that legislates universally. So that according to this principle, all maxims are rejected which are not consistent with the will's own universal legislation. That is, here I am not just asking if I could will this maxim to be a universal law, but could everyone so will this maxim? Whereby asking this question, I am treating others as ends, not means, as entitled to act on laws they can impose on themselves. Finally, in thinking of ourselves as legislating our maxims to other rational beings in this way, and asking if as rational beings they could adopt such maxims as their own, we are in effect thinking of ourselves and others as a community of beings who are treated as ends in themselves, or what Kant calls a kingdom of ends, giving rise to a modification of the formula of autonomy known as the formula of the kingdom of ends never to perform any action except one whose maxim could be a universal law and thus to act only on a maxim through which the will could regard itself at the same time as enacting universal law. By treating one's fellow moral citizens in this way, Kant argues, one treats them as possessing not mere price but as possessing dignity the dignity that is appropriate to them as beings with absolute value. Thus, in the end, Kant finds a way to group together the various formulations of the supreme principle of morality that he has located, 
and shown how they form one principle after all. Kant argues for this unity by suggesting that while the formula of universal law slash law of nature variance gives us the form of the principle, namely universalizability, the formula of humanity gives us the matter, namely treating people as ends. While the formula of autonomy slash kingdom of ends fit these both together in a satisfactory manner. In this way, Kant takes himself to have achieved his first main goal of identifying the supreme principle of morality while showing that this is a principle with several different aspects. He then turns in section three to his second main goal, which is to establish that morality understood in this way is no delusion or chimerical idea without truth by showing that we have the freedom required to follow these moral principles and that it is rational for us to do so. But we cannot follow Kant into that discussion here. Nonetheless, I hope that what we have done is gain some insight into how Kant aimed to achieve his first goal of identifying the supreme principle of morality and the different aspects that come together in the various formulations of it. Kant thought that something like this principle is the compass that we all implicitly use to guide our moral actions. It is now up to you to decide whether you think that he was right. Thank you.